This shows the Holyoke Dam, which is the first major barrier these fish come to as they migrate up the river. You'll see the black lines are the fish as they're in the whitewash getting closer to the dam. The whole reason for the dam is so the city of Holyoke can hydroelectric power, and some of the supporting areas are an eel ramp, a control center, and a penstock to help divert the water. Those fish we just saw emptied out go into the viewing room. This is what it looks like where you can see the fish before they work their way continued upstream. Here's some viewing windows and we're going to look at some video showing through one of those windows. You can see a lot are shad. All those shad that came through the lift are now put in here and it's a lot calmer water. It's very murky because of the sediment that's been in the water. We recently had a rainstorm. So you can see they're kind of working their way basically from the right side of the screen to the left side. Oh, that little fish there, uh, which looks like a baby shad. It's not a baby shad at all. It's actually an L wife. Baby shad right now are in the ocean. You also get some, this is a smallmouth bass, this green fish. Uh, it has to fight the same current that all these shad do. And you'll notice it's got a very different tail structure, making it a little hard for it to work its way. Oh, there's a striper. That's a small size striper. You'll notice all the fish are about the same size today. Uh, stripers can get much larger to the point where they can eat these adult shad. So these shad, uh, stripers, smallmouth, and small LYs are all working their way through that current upstream. There's also some other species you might be able to see. Uh, coming up here, we're going to see one of the rare archaic species. It's a sea lamprey. It's not an eel. And just an image of what it looks like from the outside. There's the shad and the sea lamprey.
want to go over the rig that I use for shad on the Connecticut River here. It consists of a willow leaf here and about three, three and a half feet of 10 pound test leader that will lead to a weight. Now the weight can vary between three quarters of an ounce all the way up to an ounce and a half depending on how fast the current's going. Uh, I use these technical anger clips to attach it. So this is my main line and I'm using braid, 20 pound braid to a 50 pound technical angler clip. Then this is an example here, to be a one ounce weight and another technical anger clip that's leading all the way down to my chosen will leaf. The rod and reel that I use uh, is a medium light power and a 4000 series Shimano Stratic. So this is the basic setup that I use. You want something that's relatively light uh, because you have to be careful with the paperness of their mouth. So you want to use a small hook. You don't want to have something that's too stiff, but you need something that can throw this ounce to all the way up to an ounce and a half uh, of weight to get it down to the bottom. Also, when you're dealing with leaders that are this long for storage, you don't want to just put them in a plastic bag because they're still going to get tangled. What I use is these little leader boxes that are used for fly fishing. Get through, put them up. They have these little trays that basically just insert right into there. Quick little rubber band over the end. And I've got all the colors that I want rigged up. Nice, ready, unfold really easy. And that is an excellent way to store a really long leader without having it get tangled. The key part when I'm fishing and I throw this out, I want to give it time for it to sink to the bottom. When I feel the bottom, then I'm just going to be consistently reeling in, giving it subtle twitches, pauses, just a little bit to get it to flutter in the water. The whole point is that weight's on the bottom and you want that willow leaf to have a nice fluttering action. This shows the underwater view of what the shad will see um, at the bottom of the river there. And if you're lucky, this is a representative sample of a shad you can catch. They're coming up the river uh, typically in the months of April and May. Sometimes you can get them into June uh, migrating up through, this is the Rocky Hill area of the Connecticut River. You can see they're very shiny. They're about, this one's about 22 inches long. Uh, in their mouths. They typically are filter feeders, so you have to be careful with the willies that you use because they have very thin mouths. They're called paper mouths. You can see my thumb locate right through there. That's what they look like on the inside. That's what they feed. They're feeding on the plankton. And when you go through and release them, I hold them in the current and typically they'll kick and swim right off. The difference between a male and a female shad, the male is called the buck which is right here, and the female is called the row, which is right here. There's no difference in the looks, but the only way to tell the difference is in a couple different things. The first thing is the size. Typically, the females are larger, between four and six pounds, and the bucks, which are usually smaller, range between three to five pounds. Another way to tell which one's a male or female is by the bulge in the stomach here. The bulge like this is usually from a big pair of roe being inside the female fish, and the male is, has no bulge. Uh, another way to tell is to run your fingers through, down the uh, stomach where the roe is, and if nothing comes out, then you would know it's a female, and this one, there's white stuff that comes out, which is how you know it's a male. That white stuff that's coming out is called the milk, this is what the milt looks like from the male shad and then obviously the row, which is from the female shad. The last uh, de designating factor is the size of the back. The back size on a female usually is fatter and on a male usually skinnier. And that's how you can tell the difference between a male and a female, which are a buck male or a roe shad. This is a female American shad. It is scaled. So I'm going to start by taking my knife, bringing it all the way down as close to the gill as I can. I'm doing a head cut. The reason why you want it as close to the head as you can is so you get the, get the most amount of meat from the fish. Then I'm going to take my 10-inch slicer and put my knife on a slight angle upwards 
so that the uh, smooth part is fishing towards the row so I don't cut the row and push up on the belly just a bit come out the back here and then slide my knife forward for the belly cut make sure my row has no nicks in it I'm gonna turn pull out my guts use my finger which is very important to have a long nail to get the membrane that's stuck in the fish out otherwise you will rip the egg sac open if you don't have that nail I'm gonna pinch it at the bottom here I slowly pull up halfway and then slide it back and it just comes out nice without ripping any of the eggs if you rip the eggs they're worth about half of what they're usually worth then I'm gonna take my knife I'm gonna slice the bloodline all the way down and then scoop that blood out I then turn the fish and slice off the rest of the belly try to do even with this side and it's ready to be washed. First we make a couple of little cuts along the row of bones. Then we split it open. Go after the thousands of little bones. Once you learn how they're put together, they're all put together the same, so. And you glue them back together. That's it.